Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's always nice to, uh, to come to Ireland, and believe it or not, the weather is actually much nicer than anywhere on the continent at the moment. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's, really ni it's really nice. Mm. So it was, there was um, the, the, the real reason why I'm here is because you have asked me to come, and it was I, w I wanted to size the opportunity. Um, and the other reason is effectively that we are launching the uh, survey on Ireland, and the main author and the one who will respond to the difficult question is sitting in the front row. <laughs> me, I'll give the, uh, the overview. Uh, but we, we wanted to do two things. One was to give you a, an overview of uh, the global outlook. Uh, given we are publishing our projections in three weeks' time, I can only show the number from November. But I will give you a hint about how we are thinking about uh, the main development since November. Uh, and the second part of the presentation, I will also try to um, give you enough about the Irish survey that you want to read it as soon as you leave this room, uh, which will be easy. Um, so let, let me start with this. Um, the, the view we had and the way we were thinking about the growth outlook uh, until, until the coronavirus was really two, in, in two terms. The first one is this is the longest expansion for, after a recession for a very long time, so we are sort of reaching the end of the cycle. Uh, and the second thing is a big disruption had been triggered uh, two years ago by, by the trade tensions. And it's very, very visible, and I will show you that. So that the way we were seeing the combination of these two is actually growth decelerating slowly and then stabilizing. Uh, because even with a phase one deal <laughs> in the US, we are not solving all the issues um, that are behind the trade tension. We're not solving them because they will be very difficult um, to solve. It's not only uh, a bilateral trade deficit issue, it's that most countries have become concerned with uh, competing in an unfair way of having an unlevel uh, playing field on competition when some states actually subsidize their firms, when you have a little protection of intellectual property rights or you have forced transfer of technology. And we all can see that when you're trying to deal with this issue, well, the phase one deal is not dealing with it. Um, and, and it will take years to actually deal with it. The second thing is it's also very disruptive because you had the trade tension, we had the trade tension between the US and China first, and then it mo it's moving to US and Europe before it was Mexico, Canada. And the type of agreement, of bilateral agreement, is actually full of uncertainty as well, because you have some threshold which triggers some reactions. So the, the whole context of trade has become a lot less certain than it was before. So what you see on the right-hand side is actually some stabilization uh, of where we see eco the economic growth uh, in the forthcoming year. Um, this were the number we published um, in November. Um, and the purpose of keeping them here is, I think, apart from the coronavirus, and I will talk a little about it, when we took stock of where we are today in preparing our projection from, from March compared with November, finally we were very much in line with the economic outlook. So that's one reason to show you this table. The other one is uh, that I can tell uh, that Ireland is obviously one of the highest growth rates with 3.6% in 2020 according to our projection and 33 uh, in 2021. So you cannot see here, but it really stands out. Um, so I insisted a lot, oops, sorry, on trade for the reason I'm going to explain uh, now. This is back, and I should have said trade and Brexit as well as uncertainty. This is back in the first quarter of 2018, so at the time before the trade tension actually uh, evolved. And this is a survey asking firms, so what are your main concerns? Um, and what we want to show with this chart is that firms, they had pretty ordinary concerns, right? They couldn't always find the right people, that's the labor shortages. Uh, they're obviously concerned by regulation. They also thought that in some countries there were weak demand, but no things stood out really. But now if I show you what they're concerned about today, 
Uh, this chart shows very clearly on the left-hand side and the red bar that what concerns them the most is economic uncertainty. Um, so what are economic uncertainty? It's trade to a large extent, but not only. It's also uh, the, the evolution of, of various regions. It's also the evolution of um, technology. Why don't we see it on productivity? Is whether growth will revive or so on. But, but trade made a big change uh, in the balance of this uncertainty. And obviously, this has driven down manufacturing and then investment growth. And I'm sure uh, you've seen that, but what's really, really striking in the current juncture is the decoupling between services and the manufacturing sector. And what has really collapsed uh, has been manufacturing, as you can see on the left-hand side, uh, with the PMI that really fell below 50, that is below uh, the recession level. Services have also uh, been falling, and that's obviously because a large part of services go into manufacturing. It's lawyers, accountants, uh, and so on, but, but less so than, um, than manufacturing. And what the, la the chart on the right-hand side um, should show you is that at the same time as trade, was, trade growth was decelerating massively and was going even uh, below zero at some stage, we also had investment going down. It's very simple. Um, they are very good and complicated academic paper showing the option value of waiting. Uh, but in simple terms, if you're a firm and you want to invest abroad, uh, you wait to see what will be the tariff and the trade type of um, agreement that, that you will see, how it will evolve, how firms are relocating production. So we have seen investment growth collapsing in tandem uh, with manufacturing growth. And that's really what has driven the slowdown that I was showing you earlier. Now, uh, until the uh, coronavirus, we were quite happy to see some signs of stabilization, thinking, okay, that's you know, bottoming out, and we are now going to stay at roughly the same growth level. <laughs> it never happens like that in economics. We were concerned to show stabilization. It doesn't really exist. Uh, but, um, but obviously, um, the coronavirus has changed things um, a little. Um, at this stage, I cannot give you a number, not only because we have our projection in three weeks' time, but also because we are still not sure when it will peak um, and whether and um, how it is going to, to spread. Um, what I can tell you is, uh, if we look at a standard virus, uh, usually it goes through the winter and starts fading um, in April or May. Um, so the first question we ask ourselves when doing this projection is when do we think it peaks and then recedes? Um, if we look at a standard virus, this seems to suggest that it will likely peak between the end of Q1 and Q2. Um, and depending on whether it's in Q1, Q2, then you can expect a recovery uh, later in Q2 or Q3. Uh, and, and when we think about it like that, you know, if we had a recovery uh, in Q2, then we could hope that by the end of the year, the situation would be normalized and we would have the same type of growth rate as what we would have had uh, absent the coronavirus. Obviously, um, if it lasts longer into Q2, if it spreads uh, much beyond China and Asia, then it's likely that we'll have global growth that will not be what you have seen on the slide with the number, and that we will have to revise uh, down this projection. Uh, so we are like everybody else following what uh, the WHO and healthcare specialists are saying, and we still have three weeks until our projection, so we hope it will peak before that. Um, let me now um, just a glimpse on a piece of good news, which is that one of the reasons why we are not seeing services go uh, further down, and one of the reasons why the global, cons the global growth is stabilizing, it's because consumption is holding up really well. And it's holding up really well because wage growth and employment have recovered up to the point that in most countries it's even bringing back people who had left the labor market altogether. Um, again, if uh, the coronavirus is short-lived, 
then we are pretty confident with that this will continue. If it goes beyond um, uh, what I was describing as a sort of basic scenario, if it, if it goes beyond Q2, and in Q2, then, then this will be different. Okay, now, um, that's for the global outlook. I can, I can also go deeper into a, what the slowdown in investment that we have observed, not only following the trade tension, but also because we haven't really recovered the type of investment growth that we had before the financial crisis. So what that, that missing investment does for future growth, uh, but in the interest of time, I will uh, start discussing Ireland first, and then if you have any question, we can come back on this. So, uh, because I was told this was slightly too long, so I'll come back if necessary. Ah. Mm -hmm. Now, let me, uh, let me give you, uh, hopefully, a feel for uh, what we have uh, in the Irish <coughs> survey. Uh, and I think that there are, in fact, uh, three points uh, we would like to make. The first one is, as I was mentioning before, Ireland growth has been well above uh, the European Union average, as you know, and it's one of the most dynamic uh, economic, which is, which is also why it's always nice to come here. Um, it has also, this growth has also helped on the fiscal side, but we think that that has that growth in the medium term uh, is, can be challenged by structural factor. So it's good in the short term, and we're a little more concerned about the medium term outlook. And we're concerned for two main reasons. The first one is what's, who, I should say, is driving growth in Ireland. Um, and as was mentioned in previous survey, it's mostly, it's to a large extent, foreign-owned enterprises. Um, and what we would like to see and what we analyze here is how to make this, this growth dynamic that, that's being brought by foreign-owned firms diffused to locally-owned firms. So how to make Ireland even more resilient uh, and dynamic. So that's one of the things. The second um, concern we have is the fiscal uh, sustainability. So again, not short term, but longer term, uh, because a lot of tax receipts come from these foreign-owned firms, because of aging issue, we also focus um, on, on the fiscal sustainability. So that's the nice part. Global, you can see uh, Ireland growth and the unemployment rate on the left-hand side, uh, which was one of the most the best performing countries in terms of unemployment as well as in terms of growth, and that has been going on for a while. <laughs> uh, and that has translated, obviously, in a tighter labor market, which is always nice because that put pressures on wage growth, and we are indeed seeing wage growth. Uh, and in one of the slides uh, that I haven't shown earlier, but when we compare in Ireland how the uh, revenue of the middle income, of the middle class has evolved, it has actually evolved, increased faster than total compensation in Ireland. So that means also that inequality are being reduced, which uh, is quite unique uh, in across OECD countries. However, uh, there's always a but or however. Um, as you can see here, um, investment has started slowing down, uh, partly because of Brexit uncertainty, partly because Ireland is such an open country that it's most sensitive to trade and protectionist um, discussion. Um, we are seeing this. It's in this context, um, and that's, that's, I will talk about this a couple of times, um, we are also a bit concerned that you know the discussion on international taxation and the possibility that there could be an international agreement uh, mean that uh, the tax position of Ireland may be a little less favorable and attractive than what it was before, which is also why we put so much the accent on structural factors like digital, like education, skills, and fiscal sustainability. Ireland has a lot of resources uh, that can make it more attractive even without uh, this tax advantage. So let me, uh, let me show you this. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's one of the 
we have many nice slides, but it, it's one of the nicest. And I'm, I'm not only saying that because Ben had to complete it in the taxi coming from the airport to make it so perfect. Um, so I'm very grateful <laughs> to him because we wanted, and, and he insisted, and I think he's very right, we wanted to show two things. First, you know, on the right hand side, how fast the productivity gap is growing, not only labor productivity, but also capital intensity of labor between the foreign owned firm uh, and the uh, Irish owned firm. Uh, and, and we really think that Ireland can do better. And what you can see just after the bar on the right hand side is actually uh, investments probably stabilizing, meaning that labor or has started declining. Maybe that labor productivity, even in foreign owned firm, is stabilizing. But that leaves a big, big gap. Uh, and Ben insisted that we should show actually the gap in level. And I think he's right because that gives an idea of how much there is to catch up and, and how good it would be for the um, Irish own firm to actually catch up with the foreign own firm. So you, you can perhaps not see, but the value added per employee in a foreign own firm is uh, about 375 euro, whereas it's 120 um, in locally owned firm. So that, that is at the, at the heart of the following. And obviously they are more productive uh, they tend to be very profitable, uh, and they obviously attract uh, all. The, they attract a lot of talent and many Irish talent. Um, so that, in fact, what we can see, what we can infer from this chart, because we don't have that precise data, but what, what we can infer from them, see, first, overall, there is a shortage of skilled people in Ireland. That's the. Um, that's the blue bar that you can see. So it's the job vacancy rate today or in 2018, the latest available data, which is much higher than what it was 10 years ago. And then the little triangle is the share of workers employed by large firms. And large firms tend to be foreign owned, not only, uh, but they tend to be. So you can see the uh, job vacancy rate and so the Labor shortage is very high in the financial sector, obviously in the technology sector, and we think for the professional sector, it's a lot linked to research and development and also uh, local firms of, uh, sorry, firms of lawyers and, um, and other professional services. Um, and one of the reasons is that um, there's a lot that Ireland can do in terms of boosting uh, education and competency. <laughs> and what this chart is showing is the skill shortage index by type of skills. Uh, Ireland in red, <coughs> OECD in green. We should have done it the other round, sorry. Um, but what is uh, of concern to us is this goes from the basic skills to basic content, basic process, all the way to the system or complex problem solving skills. Um, and obviously, I mean, Ireland's not alone in that case, but I think this is of particular concern to us because it takes a lot of time to revert. So it's very important to act super quickly uh, on this. And the other thing is, um, and again, we, as you know, look at the skills and competencies throughout the lifetime. What you also want is that people who didn't have the chance of having the right education in their youth, they get it later when they're at work and when they access the labor market, which is why we also look at adult learning. And it's all the more important today that with digitalization, a lot of us have to reskill ourselves uh, for that. And what this, uh, what this chart is showing here uh, is that participation in adult learning is limited. And that's true. So the little blue triangle are the young people um, and the blue bar are the age 55 and plus. Um, and when you see Ireland uh, in red, you can see that there's a lot to do in terms of training for the young people on the labor market. Um, and there's also a lot to do in terms of training for older people. Uh, and when I say older, I'm 55, I find that very young, but still the classification has not evolved with our pension recommendation, <laughs> which I find shocking. Um, but, but the point is really to say that, to see that there's a lot um, to do for both young and older people, and especially uh, among low-skilled persons. 
And so that's super important because as you know, what happens in digital firms is not only you have intangible assets, <coughs> digital capital, but usually you have the competency that go with it. So if you don't have the skilled people, there's no point investing in intangible assets, uh, which are very digitalized. Um, if you invest in digitalized, uh, you, you really attract straight away those people. And more to the point, and we'll discuss that, but usually they go hand in hand and the firm which starts with the right assets and the right talent can grow very fast uh, and even constrain competition in a way that, um, uh, that it piles up advantages. There's a huge premium for the first mover in the digital uh, industry. And what we show here, uh, is two things. First, the share of intangible assets is rising, uh, but we could suspect that, and I'll show you why, uh, that it actually stays within the same type of firms. Um, and second, what you see on the right-hand side, when we compare digital technology usage in Ireland with the rest of the OECD, Ireland is actually very good uh, when it comes to uh, social media use or when it comes to cloud computing, and it does much better than the OECD. But when it comes to using this for firms like enterprises, resource planning, or customer relationship management, then Ireland is less good um, or average with the OECD. And that's a suggestion that the big firms, they probably have it, but it has not diffused throughout the uh, the smaller size firm. Ah. And this is um, actually completed uh, when we look at where these intangible assets go. It will not be a surprise to you that you find them uh, in ICT, you also find them in professional and scientific and, and in manufacturing. Um, uh, to, to our mind, the fact that we have these uh, two slides suggests that there's a lot of intangible assets which are also related to patent and to research and innovation in, again, uh, foreign-owned firms, which is not bad, but it needs to diffuse. Otherwise, it, it, it leaves Ireland vulnerable to a move of these firms outside of the country. Um, now, has this translated in productivity gain? I think the chart speaks for itself, uh, and the answer is not that much. Again, a source of concern. You want productivity gain to continue increase um, so that growth keeps high and people get jobs. Um, it's also, and that's why we were insisting so much for the investment uh, in skills, because Ireland, which you can see uh, on the <coughs> right-hand side, uh, and I think that confirms that everything gets concentrated <laughs> into the digital firms where the labor shortage or the underqualification rate is, is highest is also in the same firms that have a high rate of intangible investment. Um, so if I, if I sum up this picture, what, what we suggest and show is that they are foreign-owned firms, they are very digitalized, they attract talents, uh, and they concentrate algorithm, and they keep this first mover advantage, meaning that you have in local firms perhaps less qualified people, less capacity to grow and, and attract both talent and capital, and that is really what uh, Ireland needs <coughs> to change. Um, and that's just in case you needed one more slide to get convinced, is showing the productivity uh, when we exclude digital intensive firms, so that's the blue curve, and compared to the digital intensive, um, which is the white one. And what this shows, in fact, when we look at the entry rate, we're looking at the dynamic of the market and whether there is competition and the existing firm are being challenged by other new firms. And when you see that the red line is flat, what that means is that, in fact, the, the entry rate is not as dynamic as what it is outside of the digital sector. Why is that? Uh, again, because of the complementarity between algorithm and talent I was talking about. Because also you may have a lot of issues with licensing. If it takes too long, it's too complicated, then firms have difficulty challenging the existing firm. Um, and it's also the case that the digitalization of business is changing competition. Uh, and one of the things that uh, we explain in, um, 
uh, two things uh, in terms of competition. The first one is obviously competition rules have to evolve to account for the digitalization of business. I'll give you an example of all the large digitalized firm buying very small digital startup before they reach a certain threshold to make sure that they will not grow to become competitor. And because the threshold is low, then this falls out of the scrutiny of the, the um, competition authority. Um, there's also one thing which is more specific to Ireland, which is that the competition authority cannot actually enforce, uh, because of the setup, they cannot enforce the competition measure uh, that would be helpful to recreate some dynamic. Now, the reason why uh, we were insisting so much on the difference between foreign-owned and local firms is the fiscal stance not been particularly tight over the past years in Ireland. Uh, I'm sure you would agree. And the reason why we are now getting into positive territory is because we had exceptional reset, receipt from income corporate tax. Um, and that's uh, largely coming from the foreign-owned firms, since they are the source of more than 75% of Ireland corporate tax receipt. So that means that any slowdown in foreign investment will be a big risk to um, financial stability, or at least to the, for the exchanger revenue. Okay, and on top of this, like for many OECD countries, I'm sorry to say, or I'm happy to say, I think there's an Irish say which says that uh, it's good that we're aging because some people do not have this chance. So <laughs> we're getting older. Um, and what you can see is how the population of 65 and plus uh, is evolving. Uh, and the way it's evolving, it would add about um, one and a half percent of GDP in terms of uh, spending by 2030 and more than six percent of GDP by 26 point of GDP by 2060. And that's due to public health and pension which obviously is massive because that would, uh, that would bring, and you can see Ireland in right on the right-hand side, which is slightly higher. It's in the top part of the OECD. Um, and that, that concerns us because it would bring the, the debt um, at about above 115% uh, of GDP. You will see, in, in, in our view, um, there are two things. The first one is that it's probably the case that Ireland has one of the lowest uh, tax revenue in OECD country as a share of GDP, uh, but it's also the case of the composition of taxes and expenditure. Um, and there are some recommendations in the report, and I would highlight a couple of them. One is on the tax side, how to rebalance taxation, so not necessarily increase it, but to rebalance to make it more efficient and bring in more uh, revenue. One is about the property value uh, and obviously to reassess the value uh, to take account of the evolution of, of property values. And the uh, other is also to streamline the VAT system and move from five to three uh, rates. Also, we are very much aware of the impact it may have on the low income earner, so there should be some provision for that. Um, and the on the spending side, uh, there's a lot of focus on primary health care coverage because Ireland is the only OECD country where there is no universal primary health care coverage, which obviously first creates tension in the hospital and may mean that it's not the most um, uh, efficient cost benefit in terms of health uh, system. On this happy note, I love the cover of the survey. Um, and I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, and there was a lot more. So the presentation will go up on the website. And what was, uh, oh, Laurence yeah, didn't have a chance to, to talk about today will be on the website and, of course, in the, in, in the country report as well. There's more, even more material. I have about 250 questions. Uh, so <laughs> if you don't get your question in soon, it'll just be a, a dialogue up here. Uh, Okay. And, and by the way, this is on the record. Usually the, the Q&A is off the record. We've agreed to do this on the record. Just to summarize. It's Eamon Quinn from the Irish Examiner. Just to summarize, what is your message to, to an incoming uh, government, to the politicians, yeah. on health, housing, 
the old age pension is 68. And the second question is, um, how bad could or will it get for uh, Ireland in the, from the, what comes out of the OEC-driven global tax reforms? Um. So, uh, health, pension, and the housing, okay? Uh, on the housing, our message is that <coughs> there are two things. The first one is continue with the supply side measures, um, which I think the Irish government has been doing for quite a while, uh, and that includes um, rezoning some of the land that's publicly owned, that includes allowing more building or higher building uh, in Dublin, and that also, um, includes uh, actually, I should add, taking care of public transport to make sure that the housing, which is a bit further away from Dublin, uh, can get into the city more easily. So the, the supply side, we are very much in favor of continuing. Usually the demand side measures, they just contribute to push prices up when supply is restricted. So that's not a fantastic idea. On uh, pension, um, as you very well know, the pension age has increased in 2014 and will continue to increase to reach um, 68. Um, this is a recommendation that we make across all OECD countries that the retirement age should evolve with the life expectancy. Uh, and life expectancy has increased significantly across the G20, uh, and so can the effective, um, so can the retirement age. Now, there, there's one, you know, some countries have done, um, like Portugal, from memory, have done quite interesting things, which is that each time the life expectancy increases by one year, then the working life should increase by three quarter of one year. So there's a bit of a gain for people and, and one for also uh, sustainability. We have a lot of examples that you can find in one paper of our website comparing what countries have been doing. So that we believe this, this is a recommendation we make um, across the OECD. Uh -huh. Now, as you could see from the charts, uh, one also recommendation which is common to many OECD countries is we also need to help people to actually stay in job beyond the age of 55 and too often the employment ratio beyond 55 is not high enough. So it may have to do with culture, it may have to do with anticipation, uh, but there is quite a few uh, papers and country experience showing that when you increase uh, the retirement age, it actually changes uh, employer's mindset and instead of seeing you or me as a liability with only two to three years in the firm and therefore not worth investing in, since you're gonna stay 10 or 12, then it's worth continuing to invest uh, in you. And, and that's why uh, we also put this chart on, on retraining and learning when you're at work. Um, in terms of healthcare, um, as I was saying, uh, Ireland is the only country which hasn't got uh, universal coverage uh, of primary health. And there's room for this to happen because it uh, increases, first it gives some certainty, second it increases the health of people, uh, and third it may also help you know, reduce some bottleneck in the hospital and managing that uh, more efficiently. Uh, obviously, it's not a free lunch, which is also why we talk about the reallocation of taxes and expenditure more generally. Did you have a fourth question that I have forgotten? The uh, second question was related to the OECD driven reforms. Ah, the tax. What, how bad will it get for Ireland? <laughs> so, I, I, I'll actually invite you to. This is the first time I have the opportunity to make some advertising. Um, to look at the OECD website today, where the tax and economic department uh, are presenting to the public the result of a joint study that we did. So I, I'm sure the OECD ambassador will be sensible to the fact that sensitive to the fact that you know two departments are working together very well. Uh, but the, the, the Center for Tax Policy and us in the, the economic department, we've actually um, modeled uh, from a bottom-up approach in very many details um, what that means under different scenarios, because as you know, no scenario is fixed. Uh, 
um, the, the discussion about the reallocation of taxing right and the minimum income right. We have not published country specific numbers, so I w I'm not in a position to answer your question. But if you look at what's public on the website mm -hmm. and it's made public today, it was made public this morning, you will see by group of countries. Good. Barry. Good afternoon, Barry O'Halloran, the Irish Times. Uh, you're probably aware that we're heading into a period of political uncertainty. Uh, first of all, is that likely to make the OECD revise um, its predictions and its uh, assessment of the Irish economy? And secondly, would the arrival of a high-spending, left-leaning government in power equally make you reassess uh, your view of the Irish economy? Thank you. Um, so thanks for the question. Yes, I'm aware. Um, sometimes I even read newspaper. <laughs> and uh, and um, uh, joke apart, no. We are very aware of that. I think the specificity uh, of the OECD is really to focus on the structural issues of a country. So the structural issues that we are dealing with in this report, for us, they're available for the previous government and for the forthcoming one. Um, I think it's... We're really convinced it's very important to keep uh, the attractiveness of the Irish economy on top of beyond the tax issue. There are lots of skills, there are lots of talents, there are lots of research, um, there are a lot of people, and really Ireland has the fundamentals to strive, and not only because of foreign-owned firms. There needs to be more diffusion of, of the benefit brought about by foreign-owned firms. So all this and the fiscal sustainability, there remain issues which are not short-term. They need to be addressed today, and they, will, um, and, and they will have, you know, it will not take a year or two. It will take many years. It's important to start as early as possible. Can I ask a very nerdy question, not political? The, the, your graphic on, on productivity growth, on a multi-factor basis, it ended in Ireland 20 years ago. It's extraordinary. How does that compare with other countries? Uh, oh, it's a very, so it's a very general phenomenon. Um, I mean, the intensity will vary, the magnitude will vary depending on countries. But one of the things, and it's uh, in the economic outlook, I think we presented either in May or in September uh, last year, you can see that productivity growth in OECD countries has just been a 20 to 30 years declining trend, which in part explains why you have interest rates going down also beyond monetary policy. Yeah. And it's a, it's, a, it's a huge concern for us, for, us uh, for all OECDs. I think Education issues is a concern for a lot of countries and uh, that they, there's lack of ability to capture the skill. One of the things I went very quickly about, which I can show you. Um, let me just, just this, uh, which you may have seen, which shows the risks between inverted quote unquote uh, of how automation is affecting people. Uh, and what you can see on this chart, it's the uh, percentage of workers at high risk of automation by income class. So what concerns us, it's obviously there are lower income uh, people who would be affected, but the, the one really who would be most affected uh, or largely affected is the middle income people because what, what will change is the routine task. Uh, and what we estimate at, at the OECD is like 14% of the job that exists today would disappear and another 30 or more would drastically change. Um, so the issue of education and retraining is hyper important uh, and Ireland is right in the middle uh, here. Surprise, Any, anybody else? Am I missing anyone down there? Anyone want to jump in? Okay, um, could I just follow up on that? Yeah. Uh, you know, for, for decades, we've been hearing about how technological change would create mass unemployment. Employment rates in most OECD countries are higher than they've ever been. Mm. Uh, as you say, skills shortages seem to be the, a bigger, much bigger problem than, than unemployment. When we talk about technological change, I think we often focus too much on the job destruction effects. 
Uh, how do you feel 10, 15 years into the future? Do you think the jobs that will be lost or changed because of technological change will be replaced by jobs we don't even know, that don't even exist now? I, so I think there are two things. The first one is we're concerned about this because at least we economists have talked about trade openness for 20, 30 years and the benefits it was bringing to everybody without paying attention or enough attention to the job it has also destroyed on, it, on, on its way. Um, and, and we have not, you know, on average, on aggregate, it's still the case, trade openness is good. The fact is that for some regions, in some sectors, some people have suffered. Uh, and there's very interesting research, including by um, my colleague at the World Bank, showing that these jobs that have been lost, sometimes they haven't recovered, or the, the earnings that have been lost, have been lost also for a long period of time. So I think part of us and our job at the OECD is to actually say, you know, automation is good overall. There, there's no doubt about this. We live better, um, we're more connected, and it's, and it's great. But there are people who will be left out, and we need now to pay attention to them to make sure that we don't repeat these mistakes. Um, and the second thing is, obviously, there's a need. Uh, I mean, who codes in Python here? Right. <laughs> who uses Python, which is a coding um, thing? Well, all our kids, probably none of us, right? <laughs> so to, to me, that shows that there's a need for reskilling throughout life. I mean, we all had to start using social media. We do that more. I'm sure you do it better than we do. Um, so th there's this need, and that's what we want to, to focus attention on. Also, that the skills are not the same, so then um, we can go into education. And perhaps just one more thing. We also say that because in this digital age, there's a huge complementarity between the skills and the capital. And what we are uh, showing here is that we are not investing enough into the infrastructure that will allow us to use, uh, to invest in, in digital and to use uh, to the, its most uh, optimal effect digital technology. Um, and this is a survey with firms coming from the European Investment Bank and more than half of European firms say that they can't invest because they lack infrastructure necessary to invest. It's something very uh, easy, which is actually, I think it's here, it's the adoption of, uh, for example, 5G or 4G. Talk about the autonomous car. How do you have autonomous car in a country which cannot pick up the data because it has not connected people enough uh, with 4G or 5G? Impossible. So the investment you make today, um, the care you, you, the attention you pay to uh, digitalizing the country, the territory is super important. And on top of this, uh, it's connecting people. Sorry, I no. can talk forever about this. Um, good, we've got one there <coughs> and one here. So we'd like to take this. Uh, Jeremy Harrison, I'm a member of the Institute. Um, I was very interested in the emphasis that you laid on skills and on basic skills. I started working with the European Commission in the late 1970s, um, trying to help boost basic skills throughout the member states. There were about 10% at least of young people permanently left behind, undertrained, undereducated. Since then, it seems that governments have responded on a cyclical basis only, that they haven't seriously improved that problem. And here we are still, all those years later, focused with economists raising exactly the same question. Do you feel that you have in any way well supported by education and training policy over those years? And are you being better supported now? Um. In, in a way, I think yes, uh, for two reasons. The first one is um, the first one is we are seeing the effect of a lack of education because this is leading, uh, this is creating generation of very unhappy people, very resentful, and that are calling for policies which, in the medium term, will be detrimental to growth. Uh, so I think this movement is actually raising concerns among policymakers, and um, because that can affect them today uh, as well, uh, and it's the same for business. The other thing is, um, we at the OECD, as you know, have the PISA study, um, and 10, it's now 18 years old or something like that, a bit less than 20, 
So we start having enough data on a time series basis that we can really show the impact of good or uh, less good education, the same with teacher, how they behave, how many hours they spend together, how many discussing their students, what their pedagogical training is doing, what the size of the class is doing, whether you should mix good and less good students, what's the impact on the average student and so on. So the fact that we have now more data, more, ana more analysis, more evidence, we think will help. And uh, we are seeing some countries actually using that, you know, with Finland being the ultimate benchmark for OECD countries. But for example, in my country, the fact that they've divided by two the size of the class for uh, young kids of the age of five or six is making a huge difference. So hopefully. Um, Paul Sweeney, member of the Institute and uh, former member of the Trade Union Advisory Committee to the OECD. When I was on that committee, um, the OECD had very little interest in inequality or the environment. It's hugely improved. I mean, you had on your tax policies this poisonous, no less poisonous is the right word, hierarchy of taxes, which was based not just uh, ignoring even John Stuart Mill, a liberal tax guy, you totally ignored um, equity in taxes, just focused on growth. It was um, your, your references to tax was always tax as a burden. It was never a charge. Um, and you've improved a lot since then to, to inclusive growth and sustainability. But my question is, have you gone far enough on both roads? So it's, it's a very interesting question, and I'm particularly sensitive to it because I was a young economist, probably the same age as Ben 15 years ago at the OECD. Um, and now, you know, I'm, I'm here and I can see the, absolutely, the evolution. I don't think it's, let me rephrase that. I don't think 20 or 25 years ago or 15, this was OECD specific. I think it's, it's a, it has been a general trend that we wanted to grow because growth is also bringing benefits uh, and at the same time, um, I would say until the late 90s, you know, when we had the regulation, there was a boom everywhere. It brought one billion or a third of the world people out of poverty. So to me, it wasn't a mistake to focus on growth, but now we know that it's not enough. Uh, and also that competition has changed and market has evolved and to give everybody a chance, you need to also focus to access to the same opportunities for everybody. And I think that's, uh, that's what we are doing. So we are now, um, and I think ECO is um, our department, so is our quite um, symbolic of that. Uh, we are, we have a flagship publication focusing on structural reforms that include as structural reforms what we need to do for the energy transition and what countries need to do to make sure that everybody has access to education, to health, to transport, and can boost their human capital and their well-being because that's also how you're more productive. So for me, all this go in the same direction and that's quite natural to do that. Stefan Croza, French ambassador. I have two questions. One is regarding the state of the Irish economy. If you could go back to the notion of overheating, perhaps, because I noticed you were quite conservative in your forecast, 3.3%, when the Irish Central Bank, I think, is at 4.8% growth. And the second question is uh, more general, going back on the taxation, corporate taxation discussions at the OECD. How do you see that developing, and are you confident that it will be uh, an agreement by the end of the year? Okay, um, thanks. I don't think we're way... And the 4.8% doesn't sound right to me from the central bank, but... Uh, yeah, yeah, it is. We just published this week, so it's... For the same year? We're 4.8 for 2020. Yeah, 2020, but we're... Um, yeah, so we're... we're for 2019? Uh, 2019, yeah. it looks like it's 26. Yeah, okay. So you're aware 3.6. Yeah, so we've seen strong export growth since some of that kind of stuff, but it's export growth related to international activity. So. Okay, so, there, so I think that's why it's first. Uh, in fact, one, these projections are November. 
and so on, uh, what you just described. Uh, we tend to also try to comply, but I don't know if you have anyone to comment on this on how you account for the export that percent. Like, we only published uh, two weeks ago. Yeah, 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 no, it's awesome. Yeah, so we, um, I mean, so we have very strong growth in 2019, and then we have it, we have it coming off in 2018. And we have it coming off in 2020. I think we're, and John McCarthy might also like to talk about the Department of Finance because I think that we're quite similar to their kind of profile. So, um, the, I mean, the reason that we have it coming off is because we see, partly because we see these capacity constraints starting to surface. So we have, we also have strong, quite strong export growth in 2020 and then it coming down in 2021. But we see investment starting to ease. We also see these demographic trends that we, we talked about here also having an impact on labour force participation rate and on employment growth and that bringing down consumption growth a little bit. So where um, I think that we see a, in 2019 that 6.2, you know, partly being distorted, I mean, to be, to be perfectly honest, by some of the activities of foreign multinationals. So if we look through that, we think it's, it's, it's kind of in the high fours in 2019. And, uh, and so, so we're seeing a step down in, in 2020, but not, not a huge step down in, uh, in our minds. Just to explain. So, um, as you say, 2019 was very strong. Now, one, one of the things we've taken a look at in this bulletin is, is, if you look at GDP, is where the growth is coming from. And there's been very, very strong growth in exports, which has to do with concentration in a number of sectors. So it's it's pharmaceuticals and uh, computer processors and computer services. Uh, some of that looks like it's continuing, so it's the export forecast we've pushed up linked to that, which is the difference. So if you look at underlying domestic demand, which is a, kind of a key measure that we look at, we see that coming down from about 4% in 2019 to about 3.7 to 3.2. So it's, it's what's happening on the export side with this new information that we have. Uh, is the difference. So in some ways there's not a whole lot of difference, I think. I suppose always the caveat economic forecasts, you know, it's, it's, it's somebody who did it for 10 years and got it wrong most of the time uh, can attest to Tom. Taxation. Oh, excuse me. Yes, no. Well, actually, I don't know what's more difficult, economic forecast or epidemic forecast, you know. <laughs> um, uh, for taxation, we're actually quite confident that the discussion will continue to um, to take place because it's in everybody's interest uh, to talk about it. Uh, and not all the work or all the, you know, today we present results for big groups of countries, but we obviously don't have a unique scenario in terms of uh, what share of profit you want to reallocate, uh, how you exactly you're reallocating, uh, what's the scope, what's the of industry and so on. The same for the minimum income tax, it can be various tax rates. So, so there's a lot of details that we need to, that countries actually need to continue to discuss. And it will at least, I think uh, the target is to have something by the end of the year. Uh, I cannot say for sure it will be the end of the year, it may be beginning of next year, but the, but the discussion uh, are really ongoing and I think so far proceeding uh, as, as planned in the calendar. Now it's 137 jurisdiction, uh, so it's a continuous work. Mm. Okay, we started a little bit late, so just take one final one, Tom. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Tom Hawley, member of the Institute. Um, talk about average temperature and average growth, you know, the head could be freezing and the feet burning, it's, it's not a very comfortable <laughs> position. But, um, and you've heard the, phrase leprechaun economics. There was one uh, footnote on the trade chart which was absolutely astonishing and I wonder could you shed a little bit of light on it. That if you took Ireland out of the equation, I think was it 2018, that uh, growth in global trade would drop by three quarters from 1.7 to 0 0.4. Um, it just seems absolutely astonishing. Thank you. So as I, I've also been a, an economist of the, on the Irish desk 15 or 20 years ago, and I think we also had uh, this type of discussion. It has to do with the uh, intellectual property and the patents. So it's 
all I can say, it's accounting and it's independent um, farmers. So we try to smooth it out when we obviously smooth it out as much as we can when doing the forecast so that it doesn't distort other countries. Um, because you know, the way we look at it, the trade, export and import globally have to be more or less equal. It's better. Uh, and that's obviously distorting a lot. So we usually uh, make a clouds for it. Okay, thank you, thank uh, you very much, and thank you for coming. As I. Said.